Thank you very much to the organizers, Pinaki and Orlob, for inviting me. So I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, active turbulence. So as you will see in a minute, I'm going to talk about bacterial suspensions. But, you know, from the perspective of someone who works in high Reynolds number turbulence, so uh, I think uh, sort of the, uh, the biology and the biophysics aspects of this might be washed out very quickly. So uh, just as a preamble, uh, you know, what do we, uh, so at least in the context of this talk, what do we mean by active matter? So we are talking about uh, systems which have agents, which consume energy, uh, and, and they're sort of, uh, and they're out of equilibrium. So in, in, in a short summary, these are things which kind of move. And uh, you know, there are a whole bunch of very nice papers, reviews, etc. some of which, uh, not certainly an exhaustive list, but, but a biased list, uh, which I highlight here. So it turns out that, uh, you know, this sort of uh, phenomena goes across several length scales. So you have things at the meter scale, all the way uh, at the level of a few microns, and that's where I will be focused on. So for this talk, you know, and I don't really know, uh, no, I'm pretty sure that most of what I say will not apply to things which are further up that scale. Uh, so, so in this talk, we will essentially uh, look at dense bacterial suspensions, and just for clarity, and uh, you know, uh, the, this is what I uh, am familiar with. So these are suspensions which could be either of uh, Bacillus subtilis, uh, and that's because the early sort of experiments and or, or, the, or, the, or the results, as we will see, on which the work is based, is were done with these suspensions, and and more recently, and I sort of you know use this as a crutch. Uh, uh, we have been uh, working uh, with uh, Shashi uh, Tutupalli at NCBS on the system of E. coli bacterium, and I'll show you a little bit about, uh, uh, about what we see there. So uh, this, uh, as I mentioned, so uh, this was, it wasn't really the first paper uh, to talk about such suspensions, but it talked uh, about these dense suspensions in a language which is kind of familiar uh, to us. And they talked about these low Reynolds uh, number flows of these really dense uh, suspensions. And you will see in a minute uh, you know, that, that these kind of remind us of, of an analogous problem coming from a very different world, from a very different sort of uh, scale separation. So, uh, so, so the question that one sort of begins with at the zeroth level is how do I start to think about modeling such suspensions? So there are essentially two approaches, and you know, but then sitting right there uh, as an architect of the approach that I'm not going to take. Uh, so, so one particular approach would be you know uh, to to use agent-based models. And then, you know, uh, so, so the VIXEC model of students could be one of the starting points to think about how you construct such agent-based models. And then, you know, uh, you, you add in more complexity, you add in more physics uh, to what these uh, sort of uh, individual agents should do or look like. And then you then sort of start to be more sophisticated and think in terms, uh, within that microscopic approach, think in terms of particles which have uh, certain properties, you know, rods which could be polar, which could be uh, apolar, etc. And then you get several, so this is from a recent sort of uh, review by Barr uh, et al. And then you see that this sort of approach taking, you know, taking care of individual agents and then course graining at that scale sort of gives you results which, uh, or, or leads you to a theory which is reasonably robust for a wide variety of problems. So that's not the approach that uh, you know that will be in this talk. Uh, no surprises. And and what I will be looking at is a more macroscopic approach. So here's, for example, uh, you know uh, a, a movie from the experiments that is uh, going on in Shashi's lab with one of his students and and my postdoc, who you'll uh, see in a minute. And the approach is, you know, if I zoom out a little and then I start observing these flows, they seem to be nicely swirling, chaotic, and in particular, you know, they look kind of turbulent to sort of give the game away, right? But this, again, remember, is really low Reynolds number, not the sort of Reynolds number, for example, yesterday that Jeremy was talking about. So the macroscopic approach sort of lends itself to a continuum coarse-grained hydrodynamic uh, description and a coarse-grained velocity field uh, 
just technically, you know, but, but we don't need to worry about it too much right now. I'm sort of in the framework of what would be called dry active systems. So it sort of uh, lends itself to a coarse grain velocity field of the bacteria, which has a Navier-Stokes-like description. And uh, since you know there will no be uh, there won't be time for detailed derivations, but just sort of proof of the pudding. For example, I, I'll show you what the model is. I, I won't cheat that badly. But if you look at that coarse grain model and you start sort of solving it, uh, simulate it, uh, you know you get a flow field which sort of looks very much like what we are seeing in the lab. So uh, in this talk, the bacterial suspension will be treated really as a continuum two-dimensional fluid, and we will see at those scales with that description how far do we get. So this was sort of, of course, this sort of analogy was not noted by us, but, uh, you know, uh, especially again, you know, this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, the paper that, you know, was the starting point for me was uh, from Julia's group uh, and Ray Goldstein, and what they noticed was this formal similarity A uh, you know, from their experiments with B subtilis and the continuum model, which I will show you in a minute, uh, the fact that they sort of capture things well at the length scales beyond the bacterial length scales, and the formal similarity, for example, if you look at a really high Reynolds number two-dimensional flow. All right, so this is from the uh, review paper by uh, Guid and Beck. So, so, so this sort of gave rise to this jargon. So this sort of uh, familiar, uh, you know, the fact that they two, uh, that the two look similar, gave rise to this term active turbulence. And I can't be sure whether it was introduced in this paper or before uh, in the earlier PRL by uh, yeah. Uh, whether, but, but, but this sort of gave rise to this field. And you know, just very recently, last year or so, there's a very nice review paper which focuses just on these aspects of. Of, of these systems. So, uh, so this sort of you know, leads us to a couple of uh, reasonably naive questions. So the first question that one, you know, we uh, wanted to tackle uh, or, or ask in, in, in a very sort of simple-minded uh, fashion is, in what sense are these low Reynolds number flows turbulent? I mean, active turbulence is a nice word, but you know, uh, what do we mean by turbulence here? And second, and, and this is of course clear, is that there is an emergent complex flow from the collective behavior of the, these dense suspensions. Uh, how is it beneficial to the poor bacterium? Why does it have to sort of organize itself in the way it does? So uh, these questions sort of were grappled with uh, my uh, with Chidatta, who's a postdoc at ICTS, uh, Rahul, my former grad student, he's now a postdoc at OIST, Martin, also a former student, he is now uh, a postdoc in Genoa. And I'll be sort of covering uh, some of the uh, results that these guys uh, sort of had. So OK, let's go back. So, so the hydrodynamic approach, and I'm not going to justify it, but you know, especially you know, the students, we can discuss it over the tea break, essentially gives rise to this with, with various levels of simplification to this sort of equation. So firstly, it's an in incompressible field approximation there, of course, you know, in the dense limit. And then we write down this sort of non-momentum conserving uh, equation for U, which is the sort of the effective velocity field of the bacteria itself. And, uh, and just to set things clear, uh, you know, this is the only term which I'll worry about, which is the energy injection or the drive or the level of activity or how much, how well fed the bacteria is. And for a theorist or for us doing simulations, you know, this alpha is a number which uh, varies in a certain range. And the reason this range is taken is that one is able to, uh, I, I won't show you, but we can discuss this, one is able to map these numbers to actual velocities, which, you know, uh, what we saw from various, uh, you know, uh, reports, experimental papers, was that these bacteria, uh, you know, in the two bacteria that I'm talking about, have velocities which are typically of this order. So, so, so our alpha will be constrained to, to be uh, close to what, uh, you know, what, what you actually see in, in these systems. So let's begin with the first question, which is in what sense are these um, low Reynolds number flows turbulent? So what do we know? 
So, uh, so when I talk about turbulence, I will just talk about two aspects of turbulence. There are a few other aspects that we've looked at, but uh, you know, I won't be talking about them here. The first is scale invariance and their universality. So these will be defined in a bit, but, uh, but what I mean is, so for example, in high Reynolds turbulence, independent of, you know, what sort of uh, fluid you use, what sort of experimental apparatus you have, uh, one does see a certain universality in how the kinetic energy is distributed across uh, Fourier modes. All right, so this is all that the energy spectrum implies, and there is this sort of famous Kolmogorov prediction. This is for 3D. I mean, in 2D, you have an analogous result, which sort of says that you always have a K minus 5 thirds spectrum. So there was this very nice paper by Bratinov, uh, Yenka, and Frey uh, in, uh, uh, seven years ago where they talked about, uh, you know, where they showed, and, and these results were already there in earlier experimental studies, but they sort of put it all together very nicely, where they showed that as you change activity, so it's the same uh, measurement of the distribution of kinetic energy across Fourier modes, what they so show is that it has a power law, but that power law is non-universal, and the exponent or the power law keeps changing as you tune uh, the activity of the bacteria. Uh, the other thing you know, that I'll sort of look at very briefly, for example, another telltale signature of a real high Reynolds number turbulent flow is the fact that there are large tails in uh, you know, velocity increments or gradients, and this is sort of uh, you know, brushed under one big carpet called intermittency in, 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 in the field, right? So again, you know, this is uh, experimental measurements uh, and continuum theory from Wensing's uh, paper, and they clearly show, and, and you know, in the supplementary material, they clearly talk about the fact that they detect no intermittency in the bacterial flow, either in experiments or in continuum uh, modeling. So such studies really suggest that bacterial suspensions are not truly turbulent, but what we will uh, now show that this is perhaps partially correct, and that there are truly inertial turbulence features which arise in a certain asymptotic, uh, and you can sort of talk about a critical activity. So uh, sorry for the, uh, you know, uh, the best here, but I'll go through this slowly, but it's fine if we just stick to the essential results. So what's the calculi? I mean, this is sort of a very familiar calculation for all of us uh, who do turbulence. So essentially, uh, what we do, uh, what, uh, what uh, you know, Shiddhattu, uh, Rahul, and uh, Martin did, was you begin with the equation, and all, you, uh, and all we are after is what is this exponent delta? Is it universal or not, right? I mean, this was what we had, uh, what I'd shown in the previous slide. So with these definitions, and you know, again, there's a matter of detail because these equations don't close at the second order. So I'm after a second order correlator. This is a nonlinear system with u dot u. So there is a closure problem if I'm going to look at the second order moment because the third order appears. So what we do is uh, sort of uh, use what's known as a quasi-normal approximation, which is close the system at the fourth order and then go back. Uh, it's, it's, it's a sort of uh, technical detail, uh, which I'm happy to discuss. And then, uh, you know, uh, uh, lo and behold, uh, so, so what, what one can sort of define uh, is a relation between this object, which is the energy flux, so it's the integral of how much energy you're advecting across modes, and, and, and then you can sort of close this equation, so I'll come to the results without uh, doing uh, too much about this, and then what you do is you take the alpha, which is small limit, and then you can argue, because of the way the spectrum is, that the large scales are not energetically favorable, which, you know, for uh, people who are interested in the calculation, this sort of says that there is no effective time scale in the problem, or that it's a constant time scale, unlike real turbulence. And then when the dust settles, you can actually do a rigorous calculation and show that the energy spectrum has this form, where, as you see, delta the exponent is activity dependent. So there is nothing universal at, uh, you know, at sluggish bacteria or bacteria which are lazy like me. So let's see what happens when uh, the bacteria are less lazy and they're more energetic. So 
that's in a different asymptotics, and what uh, what one uh, does is, and again, I, I realize that uh, you know it would be hard to go through the calculations, so I'll, I'll probably focus just on the result. So what we what we assume, and this is real in ansatz, is that now as delta, which was the exponent, starts becoming positive, the larger scales are feeding in energy as your activity increases, and this is clearly seen in experiments. And so you have an effective time scale, which you know we measure. So this is at low activity, there is an effective uh, you know scale dependent time scale. But as alpha sort of as as the system becomes more active, you end up generating a time scale in the problem, which is both dependent on the fact that you have an alpha induced noise in the problem. So it's an ansatz. So we just take it to be a one over k noise and a local flow induced uh, time scale, which is something that we are very familiar with when doing uh, turbulence. And for no good reason, except that's the sort of trick which seemed to work, uh, we sort of conjectured that the effective time scale is really uh, the geometric mean of this. So the interesting thing is one can also take a golden ratio of this and uh, come up with, the, with a very similar result. And what, what we then see is that at large alpha, at high activity, the energy spectrum has a constant scaling function. So we move from a spectrum which has a scaling which is uh, you know, a function of the activity to a regime at large alpha, and I'll talk about when this crossover happens in a minute. But the important thing to note is now we have a unique scaling exponent as opposed to at low alpha, where the scaling exponent is a function of what sort of bacteria you have in your system. So, uh, so, so, so of course, you know there are numerical checks to a lot of, to all these assumptions, and they kind of bear out the scaling relations that one has. And essentially, uh, when we calculate the energy spectrum, uh, we see that as we increase, so, so this is for low activity, which has this, uh, as you increase activity, suddenly you get a clear universal signature in the power law that we have. Uh, so of course, you know, the, what I presented is much more of a soft sort of phenomenological argument, but you can, uh, as, or rather, you know, Shiddhartha Rahul and Martin did do a very rigorous derivation of this, and one can actually derive it, including the exponential tail of these two-point correlators using uh, closure arguments. To, to, to actually come up with the same minus three halves result. So in essence, just to sort of uh, you know, summarize this part, we do see that there is a critical activity, and now I'll come to what that critical activity is. So there is a critical activity which the theory suggests is a number which is order minus 10. And you know, it's a sort of uh, semi-complicated way, so I, uh, you know, we can discuss this later in front of the blackboard, how this minus 10 number is achieved, where we predict that the scaling exponent for activity, which is, uh, you know, uh, 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 so all of these have negative signs, so that's why uh, it's greater than. So uh, you have an alpha-dependent uh, exponent delta, again, just to remind you, delta being the scaling of the energy spectrum. And beyond that critical activity, you have something which is stuck at minus three halves. All right. So, so this is uh, from our measurements, from the simulations. This is the transition that we observe. Uh, you will notice that the simulation suggests the transition at around minus five and not minus ten, as the theory suggests. Uh, we looked for a factor of two uh, everywhere, uh, both in our simulations and in the theory. We haven't yet seen, and so we are being faithful to, <laughs> to what we hope are, are right calculations. So now you see, I mean, if you just compare to the high Reynolds number picture that I showed you, and this is, by the way, this is a whole bunch of experimental data from various sets of uh, people. What you see is that bacterial flows beyond this critical activity are much closer to the way we think about inertial turbulence. And as I said, I'll just sort of look at two features of this. And the second feature is uh, the issue of intermittency, which was earlier measured not to be there. Uh, so now that we had this alpha C uh, sort of prediction, we went ahead and tried to look at intermittency. So what I'm doing here, for example, so these are sort of uh, color plots of the vorticity field. 
And as you go and start to detect extreme events, the top panel is for very mildly active things. Unfortunately, it doesn't really show up very well. Uh, the lower panel is for much uh, stronger active turbulent, uh, turbulent flows. What you see visually is that you, uh, you know, for, uh, that there are extreme events which, which show up only when you have an activity beyond this critical uh, value. And then you can actually sort of quantify this by looking at the distribution and the kurtosis, et cetera. And then you find, you know, uh, so, so for alpha less than, again, the same minus 5 from independent calculations of intermittency, you find that it's 3, so things are non-intermittent. But as soon as alpha, uh, as soon as the bacteria becomes more energetic, you find a sharp rise in ketosis. So, of course, in turbulence, we have some idea of, you know, the scaling of this. We, we haven't looked at that yet. And then you can also sort of condition it on scale separation, but that's a matter of detail. The big picture is that, again, when, uh, you know, when you have things which are really active, uh, uh, the suspensions become much closer to the world uh, that, uh, you know, uh, I come from, which is sort of high Reynolds number flows. And just one more sort of minor po uh, point on this um, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, and this sort of is slowly getting into the question of mixing and what's the deal for the poor bacteria, uh, you know, having done all the hard work. So this makes a nice transition. So what we also sort of looked at is essentially setting up twin simulations. So you have a system A and system B, and they differ by a very small perturbation. Eta is a white, uh, uniformly distributed white noise applied to every point. And what one calculates essentially is the difference of these two fields, which are minimally different at small uh, at t equal to zero, and then try to understand how the uh, you know, how, how, how these uh, different spreads. So it was a trick that uh, with Shubro and uh, two other students of ours, Sugan and um, uh, Dhiraj, that we had used earlier for the Euler equations. So what one sees, and this is quite uh, interesting, is that if one looks at the sort of decorrelator in our language, so, you know, Jeremy touched upon something very similar yesterday in his talk when he was talking about sponta uh, spontaneous stochasticity. So, uh, so we are still in the sort of chaotic regime where things are exponential. So when you measure this phi of t versus t, so it's a semi log plot for different activity, you, of course, see this very nice exponential growth followed by saturation as a and B become uncorrelated at some point. But what was very surprising to us is if you actually measure the Lyapunov of exponent, I mean, uh, the two curves are basically the same, but uh, you know, uh, non-dimensionalized in different ways for, a certain, for, for, for some reason. So let's look at the black curve, which is just lambda. What you see is that, again, at around 0.5, I mean, this actually looks closer to minus 3, but I'll still claim this is the same uh, minus 5 that, that, uh, that I've been pitching for. You see that the Lyapunov exponent saturates and things become maximally chaotic and stays that way beyond uh, alpha C. Now, here, uh, I mean, the earlier two things I sort of pitched for turbulence-like approach to understand uh, the suspension. But this is certainly very different. Because if you play the same game with Navier-Stokes turbulence, you have, you know, colloquially speaking, an unbounded growth in the chaos because the Lyapunov really scales with Reynolds to the power blah, where blah is very close to 0.5, depending on which uh, sort of theory you want to use. So activity is not exactly mappable to the Reynolds number is what one kind of takes away from the this message. And, and then you can also look at uh, the difference of the spectrum. This is in the Lorentz style and try to see how similar the growth is. Very good. So, so beyond critical activity, so when I go beyond this critical activity, what does it mean for the suspension in terms of mixing? Because at the end of the day, uh, my fluid is a living fluid. And so uh, the self-organization or the emergent flow that happens in this fluid must have some implications for what constitutes this fluid. So, so for this, we essentially take uh, you know, what would be a Lagrangian approach, and Jeremy introduced this uh, yesterday. Uh, what we do is, in these sorts of simulations, we now randomly sort of seed the flow 
with trace of particles. Uh, again, I'll just be reporting some, uh, you know, the theoretical work. So this is something that we are also trying to mimic in Shashi's lab to try and see this. So what we find is the following, and you know, uh, I mean, this slide should be, uh, you know, this could be the kind of take-home message, uh, even if you want to avoid the details later, which will come. So for example, let's look at this if it's sort of kind of clear. So here is a sample set of trajectories which are all artificially sort of put in the center for easy visualization. So as you see, if you look at very small activity, so which is minus one, so the bacteria is in the ballpark, let's say, of uh, speeds of 20 micron per second, uh, roughly. Uh, that's the suspension that we have. Then you see these sort of very meandering trajectories which sort of are reminiscent or pictorially, and I'll quantify this, are like you know, random walks and normal diffusion. As you start sort of you know, pushing the activity and you look at this blue thing, you start seeing that the paths are being straightened out. Right? So for a, la for a really active case, alpha minus 6, this is a good example where we sort of, uh, that sort of separated the bunch of trajectories and found that there are trajectories and a very finitely significant fraction of them where they essentially move in straight lines or largely move in straight lines, whereas there are a bunch of trajectories here which are essentially diffusive and this sort of color map is a good way to sort of uh, you know, visualize what this is. And these we realized were related to another thing, and I'm not going to talk about this uh, here because uh, this is sort of takes me far away from bacteria a little. These we found were related to these emergent structures in the flow field, and these uh, you know, have also been seen when we sort of uh, checked with uh, earlier experiment uh, like Rick Eller, et cetera, who uh, sort of were kind enough to share their uh, experimental uh, data with us, uh, that there are these sort of, you know, very big sizable patches which stay long, which are neither vertical nor straining as people in uh, 2D turbulence uh, like to talk about, but which have these very streaky behaviors. So what these streaks do, and, and uh, so, so, so you can sort of separate the flow by going in and sort of reprocessing your data and try to find where the trajectories emerged. And what we see is that if they emerge in streaks, then they have this very coherent sort of bundle-like motion, which allows them to have the sort of trajectories that we, that we, that, that we just saw. So what does it mean in, in, in real terms? I mean, this is the sort of, uh, you know, this is the kind of picture that emerged uh, from the simulations. But in real time, what this means, what this implies is, for example, if we look at the mean squared displacement, uh, which uh, uh, so, so is the standard definition of the mean squared displacement. So we looked at the mean squared displacement from uh, Shiddatta made these, so he insists that I have this. So, you know, uh, they're, they're quite beautiful uh, to, to illustrate the point. So you look at mean squared displacement of these different trajectories for different levels of activity, and then you ask the question, what is delta x squared? So short time ballistic, that's, you know, that's, that's a given, but at long times, is the exponent 1 less than 1 greater than 1? Okay, so that's the question that we are asking. So when you have low activity, and we were not the first people, so uh, Ashwin Joy and his student Sanjay from about a couple of kilometers away from here at IIT Madras had this very nice paper where they actually measured it, and, and this was our measurement, and they showed that at small activity, you sort of uh, you know have a linear scaling, so it just goes boringly from ballistic to uh, diffusive behavior with a certain crossover, and this sort of crossover perplexed us because at that time we are sort of wondering about what alpha c does. So at low activity, this is all boring. That's a sample of the trajectory, and then we discovered these sort of experiments uh, uh, by by uh, Galerial and uh, by his group. And they sort of said that, look, in our experiments with the same system, we find evidence for levy walks. And, this, and, and then there were a bunch of papers around the same time. Uh, Madan probably uh, knows uh, some of them. I've sort of given a short list uh, uh, of, of these papers where does it is it levy walk? Is there animalist diffusion or not? And you know, different sort of experiments 
it wasn't completely settled. But the question was, why has it remained undetected in, uh, in simulations, where the data presumably could be cleaner? And the reason is that uh, the simulations before were all performed with low activity. So this is an example from Ashwin's, where, of course, you know, he saw, sees the behavior which is just T. But then when, I, when we sort of started to look at the swimming speeds, etc., for the experiments that uh, Gill uh, and, and group were doing, we, we saw that you know, their swimming speeds or the level of activity of their suspensions was in the ballpark of what we called alpha C, or the critical activity. So we pushed this idea, and we started measuring the mean squared displacement as a function of activity. And lo and behold, the minute the sort of suspension turns really active. You go from the diffusive to the, uh, to the super diffusive behavior, which, uh, which some of these experiments suggested. And, and of course, uh, the trajectories, and, and this was very close to what uh, the uh, group in Israel uh, reported, uh, had, had all these sort of features of, 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 uh, of, of, of levy walks. Uh, so just to summarize, so there was this issue of anomalous diffusion in these suspensions, but it's anomalous diffusion which only shows up beyond the same critical activity minus psi. So, you know, uh, and, and, and what we did was just to try and understand whether it's the same effect. So, you know, anomalous diffusion mediated via levy walks. We sort of looked at the trajectory very closely, and uh, so, so there is a... So there is a mathematical bootstrapping that one can do, which is you forget about animal's diffusion, but you look at the levy walk statistics, which have certain power lot uh, tails, and then uh, this sort of ought to satisfy certain relations with, with, uh, with these exponents. So this was kind of slightly more comfortable or uh, made us uh, slightly more uh, believing in our data. So we sort of, again, looked at the levy walk statistics of these uh, bacterial trajectories just to close the argument and see that, indeed, uh, the picture is self-consistent for, uh, for animalist diffusion at, 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 uh, at activities which are much, much larger. Of course, one can ask a more direct question uh, to this, uh, which is, you know, uh, forget animal's diffusion, but you cast it in the sense of a first passage problem. So you ask yourself, you know, what's the statistics of things reaching an absorbing boundary, uh, uh, boundary uh, condition at some radius r away. And so using the same idea, just to, again, you know, because the results were a bit surprising, we wanted to sort of test it out, different approaches just to see it holds. And what we sort of, uh, you know, this is the standard uh, sort of uh, uh, distribution that one uh, gets from a, a effective Fokker-Planck with absorbing boundary conditions. And what we saw again is this change in behavior from normal to super diffusion, also in the first passage statistics, as we go from, uh, I, I mean, the threshold is somewhere at minus five. So as we go from minus four to minus six, there's a there's a there's a clear clear sig signature. So uh, let me end with some conclusions. So things. Uh, oh, so I have some time. I thought, uh, yeah. So things that I did not discuss, but happy to discuss because you know there are people here who uh, who, who might be interested. Uh, so I talked about the emergent universality in scale invariance and the onset of intermittency and maximally chaotic states beyond their critical activity. Again, this and the universality of scale invariance is very turbulence, I mean very inertial turbulence, whereas in my opinion, this is not. Uh, we also, uh, you know, I didn't discuss, but we talked about these sort of new features in the flow that we detect and that we see in experiments, which allows some of these phenomena to happen. I, I didn't explain the uh, connection very clearly. And that there is, beyond the critical activity, there is anomalous diffusion. And quite interestingly, and I didn't discuss this because I thought I would not have time, is the fact that there is a certain you know, to use uh, borrowed language from, uh, from a different field, there is a certain dynamical heterogeneity uh, 
a phrase I first picked up from Pinaki many years ago, <laughs> so to use borrowed language, uh, what we noticed is that there is a uh, dynamical heterogeneity in these trajectories in the sense how you would do for a glassing system. You go to the ensemble and then you pick, uh, you know, also Shoji, and there and, and there you pick, uh, you know, on uh, a subset of trajectories, and you see that they are really different from the others. So, so uh, right now, some of these things are being tested by uh, by Shiddatto, who you saw. Suresh is a, a grad student, uh, and and Shashi, and in the experiments, we are now uh, you know looking at various problems related to what I discussed, but also and by chance uh, we sort of stumbled upon. Uh, what's the role of small little polymers uh, as we kept feeding the bacteria sugar in 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 in, in this sort of animal scale? So I I, I leave uh, I, I sort of end with this question, which is where uh, I began with in this uh, business is whether active turbulence is really light fluid turbulence? Uh, not entirely sure. Okay, so thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Samriddhi. Uh, yeah, Rajesh. Forgive my uh, naivety about this, but when you showed this comparison between the initial uh, turbulence and the active turbulence, the distributions that you were comparing earlier, and you said you didn't see intermittency. The, yeah. uh, the studies yeah, yeah, sure, earlier sure. Didn't, didn't see intermittency. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the tails really kick in after about three orders of magnitude drop, and the the, the the numerical study or whatever it is. The experiments didn't go that far. Uh, yeah. is it, did they just miss it, or did you have to do something else to really capture the intermittent tail? So with the same sort of, in a completely naive language, the same y-axis <laughs> band, if you like, uh, the tails did kick in only with L. Now, again, uh, you know, for in high Reynolds number, so different world, inertial turbulence, you do see these tails spreading as a function of Reynolds number. But once it's sort of fully developed, you do have always fat tails. But here there is really, uh, in the measurement of the kurtosis, which is a very sort of sharp measurement, uh, so in high Reynolds, et cetera, you'll have a, a scaling with Reynolds. I mean, we actually don't know what the scaling with alpha is. We didn't get there. But here you do see a sharp transition from a kurtosis, which is three, Gaussian and nice, and that at critical activity, it suddenly sort of shoots up and starts growing. So the question that you raise can always be there, but at what we have seen, we and other groups, I think it is a... Uh, an onset of independency and not something which was very mildly present and not picked up. This would this would be my answer. Yeah. Thanks. Pawan and then the context of uh, the exponents, what you're talking about, the anomalous diffusion yeah. uh, thing. How sensitive uh, are these exponents to the boundaries? What you actually confine the bacteria in? Because there are cases where, for example, if you have periodic posts or something like that, you do observe some kind of uh, anomaly in, in diffusion. Would you observe such kind of effects if you take your boundaries to be specific? Good. So, uh, so what we've done is, uh, you know, the usual uh, cheating. So in our case, it's periodic boundary conditions. It just helps with the numerics. But Gill, etc., of course, had had boundaries. I, I mean, their measurements were, quote unquote, in the bulk. So bulk being a very tiny region anyway. So I, I actually don't know whether it was a boundary effect, but certainly in our case, there is a complete absence of boundaries. So this is really like an infinite bath of bacteria. So this, so in our in the simulations, it's it's really not coming from uh, from there. So experiments, you might be right. Something maybe in the lab now that we have Shashi's yeah. uh, set up, we could look at this. Thanks. On a slightly broader context, if you see the the per se the definition of active turbulence. One, can, I, can one look at this as a driven active matter? Or because the, in, in order to actually drive the system to turbulent regime, you need to actually f force this to a certain out of equilibrium condition. Would that be a connection also possible? Yes, it's driven, of course. I mean, the, so uh, I, I didn't sort of show you, 
but for example you do see the kicking or the injection of energy the drive if you like at scales which are comparable to the bacterial scale so from there you can construct the flux argument etc how the energy is going so sure it's it's a driven active matter and it's sort of uh, completely out of equilibrium but the drive is kind of very different from what, how you would drive let's say uh, you know uh, a soap film for example uh, in the sense that the scale separation between the drive and the smaller scale you can resolve which is still at the continuum approximation there is a lack of scale separation there so so it, it, it it's something that has been uh, you know observed I, I can show you a little bit uh, the data uh, on that yeah which is not in the slide uh, mother, mother so it, it's the scale separation which is the problematic thing here you're right oh uh, yeah thanks for the really great talk i have a, a broad question about this field. Um, so you focus here on dry active turbulence, yeah. but you know there is another body of literature which has the same name, but which is actually a completely different set of equations. Um, is there any reason why you'd like to focus on dry rather than wet? That's my first question. And second question, when you try to really describe quantitatively the experiments, can Sorry, you, when? when you try to uh, you know, map your theory with experimental data, is there any uh, decent way to choose whether you'll describe wet and dry or is it something you can completely uh, switch between? Okay, so wet and dry, uh, the first question. The answer is just because, uh, you know, a couple of years ago when we started looking at it, the equations for the dry system, although it's non-momentum conserving as you know, so we sort of got rid of the solvent, let's say, with which it's exchanging momentum, but that was something much more familiar. So I come from a Navier-Stokes I Reynolds on the turbulence. So formally, it sort of appeared a good starting point in, in this sort of uh, for me to get into this business. And, uh, and, and, the, and what we were able to sort of what was appealing was the Dunkel, et cetera, results. And then there were uh, further results by Christian, et cetera, on a similar uh, model with free scale viscosities, where uh, you know the mapping, mapping with the experiment suggested. I mean, even the incompressible thing is a is, is an assumption, which is a dramatic assumption, right? Which sort of said that you know this seems to do a good job. So now coming to the mapping of the parameters, because that's really where the the problem lies is that the early, uh, so, so what we did was we looked at, so once we fix, so uh, there are parameters beta, et cetera, hanging around lambda, which has slightly more physical sense in terms of pusher puller, so that was easy to fix. But then the important thing was alpha, the drive. So what, one, what we did was you can fish out, I mean, so, from the equations with the sort of uh, coefficient that you have, one is able to fish out typical sort of velocities and length scales in the problem, the polar velocities of the bacteria. And for every alpha that we do, we look at those velocity numbers, looked at the existing experimental stuff, about two or three groups, otherwise it was becoming very confusing. <laughs> and then in a notebook, okay, this is this velocity, and once that assumption is made. So we began with the length scale, which you get from gamma 0, gamma 2, some combination, I forget some of those combinations, with the experimental sort of setup. And from there, we get the alpha uh, to map to the velocity range there. But of course, it's not a very precise mapping. But could you do a similar type of mapping for wet uh, active turbulence? Uh, this, I'm not sure. Okay. I mean, I, I, mean I, I haven't really uh, sort of looked at it yet. But, okay. but we have to get there because of this polymer business to soon start thinking about the solvent. Okay, okay thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I mean, a similar question, but before that, lovely talk. And, and so, uh, so uh, um, yeah, I guess the the, uh, the proper way of doing this is to have a two-component system where you have the density of the bacteria and the background fluid. And the solvent, right? yes. Uh, uh, but as you say, there's some formal correspondence between this and the Navier-Stokes equation, so you decided to look at this. Uh, 
But also in, in sort of connecting with regular turbulence, uh, I think the sort of standard Yakut and Orsag way of forcing the thing was to generate um, sort of forcing in the larger scales. And then uh, there's a well-defined separation of scales at which dissipation happens. Here you're driving it at the smaller scales. So that itself is a bit, no, the, the analogy is a bit, uh, analogy between this and regular turbulence is a bit uh, shaky right from the start, isn't it? Uh, so yes and no. So for example, if you look at 2D soap films, uh, oh. So the, I understand the Yakut or yeah. like argument you yeah. make stochastic forcing. There's a scale yeah. invariance, or you know, in Burgers, yeah. uh, the one-loop calculations actually need that. But if you look at soap film experiments, uh, so two D turbulence, and this sort of gets into a minefield now. The analogy gets worse. So two D turbulence, because of additional conserved quantities, yeah. has this inverse cascade. Yeah. So in the last sort of 15 odd years, there have been various soap film experiments and simulations where you're forcing things at very small scales to kind of resolve the inverse cascade. Now, there is actually not really a strict inverse cascade happening in this problem because the flux has a very tiny hmm. but a distinct dependence on pi, uh, on the, uh, the, the uh, flux has a distinct dependence on the wave number, hmm. which sort of comes out in the closure calculation, which you need as an integration constant to fix the spectrum. So the analogy is still, okay, you know, yeah. uh, so, this was the yeah, last. Yeah. So, so the concern I had was about, uh, you know, uh, 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 there should be a lot of density inhomogeneity is generated as a consequence of this flow. And so alpha would be dependent on the local density. No, and uh, yes. you have taken it to be a constant. We've taken it to be a constant, yes. Uh, so uh, isn't, that, isn't that a pro, uh, another it's, issue to sort of tackle? It's a, another issue. Yeah. So what, you know, idea, so the thing that we are sort of looking at now is is first on the wet part mm. to actually make the system coupled and momentum con conserving because that's something which doesn't sit very comfortably for, uh, for a system which doesn't conserve momentum. The inhomogeneity in alpha is something uh, which I understand sort of at a qualitative level, but it's something that, you know, Shiddat is measuring in the lab to look, so PIV measurements actually is what we are doing, yeah. to, to look at different distinct patches and then to see that inhomogeneity, how strong is that inhomogeneity. It's certainly there uh, because already we've sort of kind of washed away the density fluctuations in the divergence due zero case, which is why I pointed out, right? So, so there's been two levels of cheating, which is the incompressible case and the disregard for the moment, you know, what happens to the momentum. So what we sort of, you know, done is in a way think about it like how you sort of put in the dissipative term and, for, and in, essentially integrate out the degrees of freedom which would have conserved it, yes. So, so there is a strong element of uh, cheating there. Maybe, maybe last question. Yeah, there's one more. Yeah, okay. yeah um, I have a technical question regarding the Lyapunov exponent and how you compute it actually, because I understand that you need to have two different time evolutions, one unperturbed and one perturbed, and then you need to know that which one is perturbed and by how much, and then take the ratios of the two different trajectories altogether. And then you have a multi-particle system, of course. So how do you keep track of all that while the computation is done, or the measurement is done, actually? So, uh, right. So this is actually doing it in a slightly different way. What okay. you said is, of course, uh, yeah. So what we do is we, so no particles. So this is a continuum fluid. So we, we have system A, which is in some sort of non-equilibrium stationarity. Then we create a copy of this. Right. And we introduce noise everywhere. From, everywhere. Yeah, from a uniform. It really doesn't matter. So you can introduce lo locally a bit of noise, or you can spread it everywhere in Fourier space, in okay. real space. It really doesn't matter. So these are identical up to that noise amplitude. Okay. So then what we do is essentially, again, you can take any of the fields. 
hmm. and see the evolution That's in true. time of this. So at large times, uh, you know, uh, the two were, and these are independently evolved, satisfying the same equation. Right. Right. So and the noise of wave and compressor, all and those technical things. And then this B, where you introduce the noise, is that just one one kind of noise that you introduce, or yeah, you at t equal to zero, let's say. Okay. At t equal to zero, these two uh, configurations differ by delta. Hmm. So as time evolves, we want to see how how, it how they separate. So at large times, I mean, if you take expand this quadratic, at large times it's saturation because the two fields are uncorrelated. They've forgotten their memory. So that's right. why there was this normalization with right. the time scale, uh, which I didn't explain. And so then there is this exponential and, uh, growth. Will this strength of perturbation affect the Lyapunov exponent? So for the because Lyapunov, actually I have seen a very strong dependence on this, and I'm stuck there. Actually, that's okay. The best person for this part is I think uh, Jeremy, and you should talk over uh, uh, over the coffee break. But yeah, for sure. in this regime where we are sort of really looking at the chaotic growth, mm. so once we sort of divide it out with the perturbation, the delta omega squared, etc. Again, it's something that you know, Bishek and others, and and us, some of us had seen for the spin system. Then Shubhra and I for sure. the Euler, etc. So in this way of calculating, we are able to uh, you know d scale it out the initial I see. perturbation. I see.